So Facundo Pipo is graduated in electronic engineer at the Cordoba National University in 2008. Since then, he has worked in Calify, Argentina, as uh, systems and RTL developed for four order correction systems. And uh, so uh, you can see many other achievements of uh, uh, Facundo here in uh, his short uh, CV. And uh, he's worked in uh, ITERAS in Cordoba also since uh, 2018. As an IT design service provider specialized in the state of the art uh, data test intensive applications. Developing system and electrical property blocks for communication and sensor application. And his area of expertise is, includes system architecting methodologies, nuclear magnetic resonance technology, forward error correction, probabilistic constellation shaping, communication protocols, information theory, and optimization algorithms applied to optical communications and sensing system. So thank you very much, Facundo, to accept our invitation. Then I will uh, give you now the control of the presentation. So, this is all. So, now you can uh, forget to take that just to put it on your slide. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for, uh, for your kind introduction and also for the opportunity to share uh, over here a bit of the work we are doing at uh, here at Titera in, in Cordoba. So this talk is about the optimization of a forward error correcting system using genetic algorithms. It's, it's part of the work we are doing here, uh, here at ITERA. The, this talk is organized in the following, following items. Quick, uh, a quick introduction to start with about, uh, about ITERA and what we do here. Then an introduction on the problem we are about to optimize, so this uh, forward error correction uh, system. Then also a quick introduction about genetic algorithm to put us all more or less in the same page about what, what they are, what they are used for, what are their, um, their, their main characteristics. And then going inside the how to use genetic algorithms for optimizing the forward error correction system, so the OFEC. And to finish with some, uh, some results, some curves we have seen uh, while, while doing the optimization. So first, a quick introduction about uh, about Ditera. At Ditera, we are at uh, a design service provider located uh, in, in Cordoba, in Argentina. And we develop systems and IP blocks for data path intensive state of the art information and communication technology applications, mainly in, in coherent communications. What are the services we provide? Well, we do uh, all the way from system level specification and an analysis and definition, uh, modeling of components, channels, algorithms, simulator developments, macro and micro architecture uh, design, front end, and also validation, integration, time in power area analysis, and uh, interaction with backend and production teams from, from our customers. What we are, we are currently working in uh, developing high performance IPs for optical communications together with IDEA over there in, in Campinas, Brazil, in uh, deep sub micron technologies, so seven nanometers uh, and below. And we have done uh, a bit of everything in the, in, for, for optical transceivers, uh, especially in the data path, uh, uh, in the digital part from CERDES data interface doing uh, physical coding sublayer, constellation shaping doing constant composition distribution matcher blocks, uh, forward error correction doing BCH codes, Reed Solomons, uh, LDPC blocks, uh, FECs, uh, braided codes, and also on the DSP, both on the TX and the RX side with uh, frequency or time domain pre-emphasis filters, timing recovery, IQ compensation, so uh, many, many blocks over the full uh, data path. So now let's take a quick look at the problem we are 
trying to optimize using genetic algorithms. So to start with, um, what, what does a communication channel look like when we have no error control? So communication channels, they, they introduce errors. So we, we have a transmitter which wants to send a message to the receiver and that needs to go through a communication channel. Um, in, in our case, that's mostly uh, fiber. And basically the channel has a limited signal to noise ratio and that causes some bits of the message uh, to be flipped and causing an error at the receiver side. Um, over here we are assuming a, an additive white Gaussian noise. So basically due to SNR we have uh, uh, the symbols that we transmit from one side. They get uh, sim uh, noise added to them and that can make the received symbol to look more like a different symbol than the ones we transmitted and that causes a, a communication error. Now if that's all basically the receiver has no way to distinguish if the received message was okay or not and then it's up to higher protocols to ask for a retransmission or, or something like that to cope with the error. Now what one of the technologies to cope with this is forward error correction, FEC. Um, um, what what is it about? Well, it involves basically adding two blocks, two macro blocks to the communication channel. Um, we have an FEC encoder, which adds structure redundancy to the message. So that means that over the channel we are transmitting more more symbols than the strictly necessary symbols to uh, to convey the message. And that structure re uh, redundancy allows the FEC decoder, which is at the receiver side, to correct errors without the need of retransmission, always within certain boundaries, of course. But that improves uh, the reliability of the communication. So over here we have a, a, a very simple example. This is a repetition code. It has no practical uses, but it's, it's good for, for this kind of, of examples in which basically if we want to transmit a one, it is encoded as three ones in a row. And if we want to transmit a zero, it's encoded as three zeros in a row. So basically for each bit we want to transmit, uh, each bit of message, we need to transmit three times more, uh, more bits. And it's basically the same bit transmitted three times. At the receive message, we can have some flipped errors. Over here they are marked as uh, red. And basically what the FEC decoder is, does is try to identify which is the message that was most likely transmitted based on what it could receive. Okay. So in this, for example, in the first one, it sees two ones and a zero, and that looks more like uh, a triple one than a triple zero. So it decodes it as, as a one uh, and so on for the other three examples. Now, what is the OFEC and why do we need to optimize it? So, um, first of all, the open ROAD uh, is a specification for interoperable, reconfigurable, optical ad drop multiplexers. And the OFEC is the, the forward error correction system that's part of that specification. It is a high performance uh, FEC. It's block code based and it uses iterative decoding. And that's, uh, that's an important part because the decoder is what we are optimizing. Um, what does it give? Well, it saves 11.6 dB in signal to noise ratio for 400G transmission for a bit error rate of 10 to the power minus 15. That's a, a normal metric or a normal uh, bit target bit error rate. So one bit error in 10 to the power 15 transmitted bits. And what does this give to the communication channel? Well, this you can translate it in many ways. Uh, that can mean or can be used for lowering the transmitted power, for transmitting uh, over longer distances, for lower the requirements for optical and DSP components, or to have more reliable communications. And uh, it doesn't have for free. It's a block that it's, uh, it's a big block and it consumes about 20% of the total power consumption of the optical module. So that's that's quite a lot. And about a third of the digital processing part. 
Uh, it also requires a significant silicon area that depends on, on many things, but uh, it is an area that you measure it in square millimeters. So it's also, it's, it's a big block and it sinks a lot of power. So uh, even small savings that we can do in, in power or area are, are significant for the, for the whole system. Now, this is a bit a look of what uh, a generic OFFECT decoder looks like. Uh, and here we can see a bit uh, on what are the parameters we are, we are optimizing. Um, so basically the decoder receives input symbols uh, from, from the left, from the channel. And the first thing it needs to do is, is to make the soft metric calculation. What's, what are soft metrics? Um, soft metrics indicate uh, or are, are a processing of the input symbols and they indicate whether the received symbol was more likely a, or the bits extracted from the symbols are more likely a one or a zero. And not only that, but it also gave information about how reliable that decision is. So it's not the same uh, to have a, a one and, and the system being very sure that the, that the received symbol or received bit is a one than to be very close to the decision border, in which case the decision has a very low reliability. And over there we have some parameters to optimize like fixed point resolution, scaling factors, uh, that, that kind of things. Then basically I hope you can see the gray lines. Um, we have a number of soft iterations, which I will explain uh, in the next slide, what, what's the difference between soft iteration and hard iterations. And following the soft iteration, we have a number of hard iterations. And in the soft iterations, we have uh, several parameters to optimize as well, like fixed point resolutions, parameter for making candidate code words, gain and saturation values for updating the soft information. Um, and then at, at the end, so after the uh, hard iterations, we need to discard the parity bits, so the redundancy, uh, because that, that has no use beyond the FEC and uh, it provides the coded bits to uh, the following blocks in the, in the processing chain. Now I'm, I'm talking here about soft and hard iterations, what are they? Uh, over here we have a, an example of a hard iteration on the right, in which what we see is on the top we have the received uh, hard decisions, uh, a sequence of ones and zeros in, in blue. And in the bottom, we have the output of that hard iteration. And what we see is that a hard, uh, a hard iteration, a hard decoding, uh, flips some bits, but it has no, no information about how reliable those bits were in the first place. So it has quite some limited information to make the decision. And it makes a hard decision and a bit is, is flipped or is not flipped. So we can see here in the three red ovals that this hard iteration flipped those three bits uh, and, uh, and left uh, the reminder intact. On the contrary, a soft uh, iteration has a soft metric as an input and also a soft metric as an output. So here we can see in, in the dashed blue line, um, the soft metric that is entering the, the soft iteration and red we see the soft metric it has, that is coming out of the soft iteration. And what the decoder does is it uses the redundancy to make an, an update on the metric, which can be a small update like we see uh, between, uh, and, uh, between one and two in the horizontal axis. Uh, so it's this, the second symbol. It can make a big update like in the third, in the fourth symbol that doesn't change the decision and increases the magnitude, so it doesn't change the sign of the soft metric and increases the, up, the amplitude. That means that, um, that that bit has now an increased reliability, uh, or at least the, the, the soft iteration is confirming that decision. And in the seventh symbol, uh, we see that the contrary is happening, is that the soft iteration is making an update and it's actually changing the sign. So it reverts the, the original decision and it's, it's flipping the sign, keeping a low, a low amplitude. So 
there is a, a significant gain from making soft, uh, soft iterations but it also comes at a cost. Uh, they are between, uh, depending on the code, but they are between one and two orders of magnitude more expensive in, in power and area than a hard iteration. Okay. So those, those are the parameters we need to, to optimize. And then we have some key performance indicators, which are, which are the, the metrics that are used to evaluate how good our system is. And those are basically four. Um, one is the signal to noise ratio required to obtain a target BER of 10 to the power minus 15. So on the bottom right, we see a graph in which we can see in, in the, the blue line, what is the signal to noise ratio that is required for achieving a bitter rate of 10 to the power minus 15 without any FEC, and that is around 25 dB. Um, 25 dB is a lot of signal to noise ratio, and that basically means that the probability of a bit being flipped without any uh, any extra measures like FEC or anything like that, uh, that is already, the signal to noise ratio is being off so that the bit error rate is already below 10 to the power minus 15. But if we add an FEC, we get the, the kind of thick gray line, which says that um, if we use the FEC, we can achieve the same reliability with something like 13.3 uh, dB of signal to noise ratio, which is a gain of more than 11 dB compared to the, the uncoded transmission. The other key performance indicators are the usual ones, so latency, so that's the average time for an information bit to go to the, through the full FEC system, uh, including both the, the TX and the RX side. And of course, power and consumption and silicon area. So to summarize, the, the problem we are about to optimize uh, has the following variables to be optimized. So number of soft iteration, number of hard iterations in the decoder, um, uh, fixed point resolutions for the symbol to soft metric conversion, the fixed point resolution for the soft iteration and some sets for uh, sets of parameters for soft output calculation and, and candidate generation and other internal parameters for the soft iterations. There are about 40 parameters in total that we need to optimize. And those are the knobs which we have to, to play with. And we are uh, we want to optimize latency, power, area, and the signal to noise ratio and target uh, target BER. And from those we can um, there are kind of two kinds of them. So for latency, uh, we have a hard threshold of three microseconds. Um, we, are, we do not accept anything above that, and we are not really interested in anything below that. So that's a, a kind of a, a yes, no. So below three, everything is okay. Uh, and above three is, is a no-go. The same for signal to noise ratio at the target BER. So we want that to be below 13.35 dB, which means an 11.6 uh, dB net coding gain. And uh, like with the latency, uh, we do not accept anything beyond that, but uh, we are not uh, we are not paying for anything below that either. Okay, so we want to be basically spot on. And we have power and an area for which, of course, we have we do have a budget. But if we can have some extra savings, that that makes our product better. So that's that's the problem to be optimized, and we are going to optimize it using genetic algorithms. So what what are genetic algorithms? Um, well, they were uh, yeah, it's an, an an old idea. It's from the early 70s, and it's a stochastic algorithm. So there are probabilities in it, and they are based on the principles of natural selection and natural genetics. And they have been used over many decades for optimizing different problems and of even for, for machine learning. So how can you use a genetic algorithm to optimize a problem? Well, it basically works by maintaining a population of individuals, individuals being uh, specific configurations of the systems, 
uh, which which have a one to one relationship to, to genes and chromosomes. And probabilistic it modifies and update the population by some genetic operators such as selection, crossover, and mutation, uh, trying to find a near optimal solution of, of the problem. So let's let's look deeper on that. Uh, it is an iterative process. We can see it uh, down there, and it all it all starts with a random population of individuals. And what what is an individual? It's a set of genes, which is equivalent. It's not the same, but it's equivalent to a set of configuration parameters of the system. For example, two soft iteration, ten hard iteration, and a resolution of five bits or whatever. Uh, a set of uh, a combination of parameters of values for each parameter is an individual. So we start by creating a random population. So the next thing we need to do is to evaluate those individuals against the metrics which we are going to use to optimize the system. Um, and we do need to evaluate the fitness, so that's, that's how it's called, so the, the performance of each individual of that population against uh, the, the, the key performance indicators. The next thing we need to do is to select parents. So for each new individual uh, that we need to, to generate, we need to select a, a pair of parents. And basically the, the key concept here is that we reward the best individuals with more chances to be parents. And being in a parents means that their, their genes, so their, their characteristics uh, are used and are propagating to subsequent generations. Okay, so good par the characteristic of good parents have more chances to be used again and again in, in future individuals. Now, once we select the parents, what we need to do is, is to generate the new individuals, and that's made by combining the genes of a pair of parents to produce new individuals. And at the end, we add some mutation, which is basically randomly modifying some of the genes of the new individuals in order to add some, some extra variation and genetic diversity to the population. Basically one loop of that uh, uh, of that closed uh, closed loop is a generation and this runs for multiple generation again until uh, yeah the resources are over or until a, a good enough solution is is found. So that's uh, very quickly what the genetic algorithm is now the next part of the presentation is more more concrete and this how do we use a genetic algorithm for optimizing the OFAC? okay so here is is again a look of the optimization problem in which we have several parameters and several key performance indicators and uh, basically we need to make the evaluation of uh, each individual over those four key performance indicators, performance, latency, power dissipation, and silicon area. And for evaluating performance, that is relatively cheap. It takes like uh, one hour of simulation of one core, so we can run uh, many of them in, in a decent computation grid. We need to evaluate the latency, which is basically for free. It's just a, an, an algebraic uh, calculation. But then to evaluate power dissipation and silicon area, that's rather expensive because we need to run synthesis, we need to run uh, power estimations, we need to make configurations. So that, that is something that really takes a lot of computational resources. But one of the things we observed is uh, that not every parameter impacts every key performance indicators. So in particular, uh, the ones that impact power and area are a, a relatively small subset of all the parameters, which are more or less 25% uh, of them, which are the, let's say, the, the big parameters, like the number of soft and hard iterations, and especially the fixed point resolution, uh, and some, some other internal parameters like sets for uh, candidate generation. Um, those parameters, they impact all the key performance indicators, latency, power area, and signal to noise ratio and target BER. But then we have 75% uh, of the parameters. Um, they only impact signal to noise ratio at the target BER, and they have a, a neglectable impact on power area and latency. 
those are the, the sets for output calculation, like multiplicative constants, offsets, uh, saturation values, that kind of stuff. So how do we use this split in, oh, sorry, and uh, we call the, the parameters that impact latency power and area to be species parameter. So all the individuals of one species will share the same value for all these parameters. And the ones that uh, they impact only the signal to noise ratio of the target BR, we call them individual parameters. Okay. Now, how do we use this to make the optimization? Well, we basically split the optimization in two nested loops. We have an, uh, an inner loop that uses the genetic algorithm to modify and to optimize the individual parameters, so the, the, the set that was below on the previous slide, using only the signal to noise ratio at the target BER as a metric, as a, a, a driving uh, force for the algorithm to find a new, uh, a good individual. And on an outer loop, we are on a, on a human procedure, so really people processing the data and generating and modifying the species parameters. Um, we are using the signal to noise ratio at target BR and also latency power and area to uh, modify the species parameter. Okay. In that way, we can uh, reduce the resources to estimate latency power and area because we do it only once for a full species uh, and then we say uh, we approximate that all the individuals of that species will share the same latency power and area and then with the genetic algorithm we basically find the best or a near best individual within the species and that gives us a full set of parameters because we, for a full set of parameters, we need both the individual and the species parameter uh, to, to decide what is a good individual and what not. So another thing we needed to, to build or, or put together was the optimization engine. So what's What's the optimization engine? It's, it's the system that allows us to use the genetic algorithm. And it basically starts with a genetic algorithm engine that is doing the, the genetic of variation of uh, selection, crossover, mutation, that kind of things, which is basically at each uh, iteration or at each generation, it generates a pool of, it, it adds individual to a pool of individuals to be evaluated, okay? Then we have a simulation grid manager that basically picks them up and send them to the available computational resources. So basically uh, cores at uh, PCs in our grid, servers in our client uh, uh, network, that kind of stuff. And it basically uses a configuration file to run a fast and configurable C++ model. Now it, it does need to be fast because the speed with which we can run generations and make the optimization is basically uniquely defined by the speed of the uh, C++ model. The C++ model takes a full set of parameters and basically delivers as a result the signal to noise ratio at the target BER, uh, which is uh, stored in a JSON file configuration file that includes some results which are harvested by the simulation grid manager and placed on a pool of evaluated individuals which are the uh, the ones that the genetic algorithm can use to produce new individuals to be evaluated and close the loop and of course everything goes to a database now now we need to start defining how we use the genetic algorithm because genetic algorithm is uh, uh, has lots of flavors and configurations so we need to define how we're going to implement it so one of the things we need to define is a trade-off between the accuracy of uh, the simulation and the speed of the simulation okay so basically the, the idea is quite simple. If we go on very precise simulations, uh, they take more computation times. And that means that um, completing a new generation takes longer 
and that basically makes us slow exploring the solution space or gen uh, evaluate, generating and evaluating individuals. On the other hand, if we go too much to the low precision, that means that the precision of the of the measurement of signal to noise ratio at the target BR is, is noisy. And that means that when we make, uh, when we give the best individuals more chances to propagate their genes, uh, we are making a lot of errors because there is noise in the evaluation. And that makes us, uh, even when we explore the solution space faster, uh, we take longer to converge because we are not rewarding the best individuals because there is a lot of noise in that. So what we see here is on the right, um, yeah, for, for estimating the signal to noise ratio for a beta rate of 10 to the power minus 15, we would need to simulate at least, uh, yeah, several times much more than 10 to the power 15 bits and that takes a an enormous amount of computation time. So what we do is we measure the signal to noise ratio at much more modest uh, bit error rates and then we extrapolate. So if, if we are extrapolating from farther away we are making uh, more errors on the extrapolation. And what we see on the left is several runs of the same individual. So exactly the same individual uh, running multiple times we have one simulation of 6,400 hours, which is the green one, which we take as, as, as the true value. That's a simulation that went down to 10 to the power minus 12 or, or, or a bit beyond that. And then we see what happens if we choose simulations uh, or, or evaluations that take 15 minutes. Those are the yellow triangles. So we see that there is a, a scatter in the results. So these are four repetitions on the horizontal axis. And there is a scatter of about 0 0.015 between the, the biggest and the smallest. Then we see that for one hour, which are the, the blue squares, that we do have an offset of about 0 0.007 uh, towards the negative side. But the precision is quite good and there is a, a, a very small scatter of, of the results. And of course, with four hours, it gets better and the offset gets smaller. Now, we just said that we need just enough, sorry. Uh, so we need, what's the, the sweet spot in that, uh, that trade-off? Well, we need just enough precision to distinguish good candidates from bad candidates, uh, good individuals from bad individuals, uh, so that we can reward the good ones with more chances to propagate their genes. Now, that evolves over the convergence of the system. What we are seeing here in the graph is the evolution of the key performance indicator, so the signal to noise ratio at the target BER, over the generation. So the horizontal axis is the number of generation, but you can also see it as uh, time or computational resources. So what we see here is each red dot in the graph is an individual. And in the blue, we have the mean and uh, orange and green, uh, we have uh, plus minus one sigma over the mean. So what we see here is that the scatter at the, the uh, generation number 12 is like three times bigger than the scatter at the generation number 50, 55 or something like that. Um, and that means that distinguishing good from candidate from bad candidates uh, at generation 55 requires much more precision uh, than distinguishing good from bad candidates at generation number 11. Okay, so that's something to, to take into account in order to adjust the simulation accuracy versus simulation speed trade-off uh, as the generations go by based on the scatter or, or uh, some other metric. Now, we have said, okay, that's that's how we define how we are going to simulate. And then the next thing we do after we evaluate all the individuals and we know what the signal to noise ratio at the target BER is for each individual is to select 
uh, parents for each new individual that we need to build for building a new generation. Well, the, the strategy we are using over there is tournament selection with replacement, which basically for each new individual that we need to make, we select two grand random groups of size N, and then we will discuss what N is, out of the pool of evaluated individuals. And then what we do is that the best of each group is selected as the parent of the individual. So on the right, we see a curve that has uh, on the horizontal axis, the ranked parents. So zero is the best, the best individual from all the, from a previous generation. So all the, the candidates for being parents. And the number 200 is the absolute worst. And on the vertical axis, what we have is the average number of direct descendants. So uh, individuals of the new generation that were made using their genes. And what we see is that if the tournament side is, is very big, like for example 64, we see that only the first uh, five or ten individuals are propagating their genes to the new generations, while uh, the rest have basically no chances. And that causes lack of diversity, because uh, we end up with a, a very small set of, of genes to, uh, to select from, and that hinders the evolution because it it uh, in um, yeah it doesn't allow the genetic algorithm to create new individuals to explore. On the other end, we have tournament sizes of one or four. One is, is actually a degeneration, in which we have a much more uniform probability for all the individuals, independently of whether they are very good or or, or not so good of propagating their genes to new generations and that basically uh, has a lack of progress because there is not uh, yeah, the driving force to select good individuals is too weak and then the algorithm takes uh, takes too long to find uh, to find good candidates so what what we are using is tournament sizes of 16 which is kind of a compromise between uh, between both or actually getting away from both uh, lack of diversity and, and lack of progress. And uh, generation sizes uh, are of, of size 200, like we see on the horizontal axis. Now, once we select uh, a couple of parents, what we need to do is to generate new individuals, so ch uh, children, out of those parents. So this, there are several uh, traditional strategies to do so. Um, we have, for example, single point crossover in which we take, um, sorry, to explain a bit more the graph, what we see as uh, a row of squares are the genes of one of the parents and the row of red square is the genes of the other selected parents. And what we do with single point crossover is we generate two uh, two children out of those parents and how do we do that well by selecting a point over the set of of genes set of parameters and from that point to the left the, the genes are from one parent and from that point to the right the genes belong to the other parents you can have two point crossover which is basically the same idea but we check we take uh, two points um, you can continue with that and the way we are doing it is with uniform crossover, which basically for each uh, gene that needs a value for, for the child, we randomly select uh, uh, a parent for that gene, and then we copy the gene of that parent in the children. What is the good thing about uniform crossover is that on the single point crossover and two point crossover, there is uh, a tendency of neighbors, neighbor genes to, to stay together and they are only split if the, if the crossover point hits it right in the middle. So there is a lot of inertia of, of neighboring genes to stay together, while at uniform crossover you don't get that. And also you get more independent on the way you order the genes in a sequence and, and that kind of things. Now we are talking about genes uh, and how to, to cross them from the parents, but what, what are those genes? Well, 
the genetic algorithm operates on genes, which are an abstract representation of an OFECT characteristic, and that is that is a key concept. Uh, it's not the parameter itself, but it is an abstract representation of it, and we choose to have each gene as an integer or a floating point number that has a dynamic range or a set of allowed uh, allowed values. And what you do need to have is a bijective translation from a set of gene to a set of all five parameters, so by some uh, algorithm, genet um, mathematical operations or whatever, we need to be able to convert uh, genes to affect parameters like number of iterations, fixed point resolutions, gains, saturation values, that kind of things. And why do we need the abstraction? Well, that is very convenient for facilitating the genetic operations. Let's, let's take an example. So one of the examples is that we have a, a parameter called, called alpha in this case, which is a parameter for each soft iteration. And so if we have five soft iteration, then we will have five alpha parameters. Uh, it's actually two times the number of soft iteration, but it, it doesn't matter too much. And by domain knowledge, we know it needs to be monotonic, monotonically increasing for subsequent generations. So the, the value of alpha for um, of, of alpha two needs to be bigger, uh, equal or bigger than the value for alpha one. And one of the things you can see is that even when the initial population fulfills the criteria, after crossover, many children do not. Um, here, for example, we have two parents with three values for alpha, and when we combine it and we get the first alpha from the first parent, the second alpha from the second parent, and the third alpha from the third parent, we see that even when both parents had monotonically increasing alphas, the, their child doesn't. And that is, that is a problem. So the abstract representation can be used for solving this, for example, by defining that the gene uh, linked to alpha is uh, a delta over the previous alpha, or by abstracting the full line of alphas in a, an intersection and a slope and making it uh, uh, all alphas a linear function of the number of iteration and that kind of things. So, that, that makes it much more convenient for the genetic algorithm to optimize. And that's also a way to reduce the number of parameters and, uh, and, and, and other reasons. So it's, it's good to make use of that abstract representation. Then another thing we have is the mutation rate. So after making a child by combining the genes of the parents, uh, one of the things that we that we have is that, yeah, the, the genes of the childs are selected from the gene of the parents. So when you look at the generation, their genes are a subset of the genes of the previous generation because they are selected from them and some of them are filtered out. And this this causes a loss of diversity, which in the long run uh, hinders the evolution. So one, one strategy to mitigate this is to add mutation in which some of the genes of the newly generated individuals are randomly modified. And the way we implement it is that for each gene, we, we give it a probability, a configurable probability of being mutated. And when we mutate it, we mutate it with a, a, a Gaussian uh, distribution, a normal distribution with uh, a sigma uh, that is proportional to the dynamic range of that of that gene. On the right, what we see is the convergence of a parameter over generation. So on the horizontal axis, we have the number of generation and the vertical axis, we have the value of the abstract representation of a parameter, so a gene. And what we see is on, on the red oval on the right, is that this, this is converging to a value close to 0 0.1. And if we move towards the left, we see that around generation 10, we had only uh, something like six or seven values for that gene in over that, that dynamic range between 0 and 0 0.2, for example. And the mutation is what is giving us more values to explore uh, in, in the interesting range. 
Mutation also generates uh, very bad experiments. For example, the two dots that we see uh, in this area over here. But that's not a problem. It's uh, because they are quickly filtered out because they are uh, their, their performance is so bad that they have no chances to um, for their genes to propagate to future generations. So they are like. Uh, short experiments to see if uh, that value was good or not, and it was not, so the algorithm quickly filters them out. Another thing we had to solve was that our, our computational grid, our simulation grid is quite dynamic because it's composed of a uh, server of our, uh, our clients. Uh, and also our our laptops. Uh, basically, every core we had, it's it's added to the simulation grid, and that causes that some of some of them are up, some of them are are down. Sometimes sometimes we close the lid, we take them home, and we open it the next day, and that causes that the order at which individuals are evaluated or the results are available is not the same as the order in which we generated the individuals. So. There are some individuals that were uh, that end up being analyzed uh, a couple of generations later than all the other individuals from that generation. So what we do is we split each generation in four pieces. We call them partial generation. Uh, and for us, a generation is 200 individuals, and we split it in four pieces of 50. And every time we have new 50 new uh, evaluated individuals, we generate 50 new individuals uh, with the operations of selection, crossover, and mutation. But we don't only use those 50 individuals for making the selection. We use the last 200 individuals. After 200, they become uh, obsolete, or basically they are not eligible anymore for, uh, for having offspring. And that allows the grid to be continuously working and it also makes the system more immune to um, individual getting stuck in a laptop that was closed for the weekend and was not operating. Um, so that's that was a bit on, on the configuration of the genetic algorithm and then we will see some results, so some curves generated and to see some some interesting stuff about how how it works and how parameters converge so what we hear what you see here is again how the key performance indicator so the signal to noise ratio at the target BR evolves over generation or over time and we see that the progress is quite smooth it looks like an exponential curve makes a lot of progress in the beginning and then it starts slowing down and Besides uh, a very, uh, yeah, a, a very smooth curve, we have some uh, loose points, very high up and very high down. So well, this one over here down, for example, is simulation noise. <clears throat> How do we know that it's simulation noise and it was not a mutant? Well, because this one, because it's, it's by far the best of all the other individuals in his generation, this one for sure had a lot of descendants. But uh, I, we can see that in the following generations, there is no other individual that is even close in performance to this one. So this must have been uh, simulation noise. On the other hand, we have here uh, a, a very bad individual that could also be simulation noise, but it could also be a very unfit mutant. Uh, with, with a parameter that was uh, a gene that was way off the, the, the reasonably good values. And that basically is quickly filtered out because this one will not propagate uh, its, its genes. Now in this slide, what we can see is the evolution of one of the genes. So what we see is in the horizontal axis, the generation as well. And on the vertical axis, this is the abstract representation of uh, the soft information update gain for the first iteration. So this is, is basically how strong the modifications uh, or the update of the soft metric is for the first iteration. And we see that um, originally there is basically a, a uniform 
uh, distribution of individuals on the full dynamic range. And that quickly converges to a value that is uh, yeah, over here. And we see that the very bad genes, so stuff very high up, is extinct very fast. So after generation number seven, there is nothing above, above this line. Then a bit later on, some not so bad genes become extinct later. Uh, and this slowly, slowly converges to a very narrow band. And this is the, the optimum value or uh, very close to the optimum value is, is somewhere in that small region. Now, what we see in, in this one is the convergence of a lower impact gene, which is also moving around. It's, it's, it's going somewhere, but it doesn't converge to such a narrow, uh, narrow area or narrow range of, of good values. Why is this? Well, because the impact of this gene over the key performance indicator, uh, it's not so big or it's not big enough for the algorithm, genetic algorithm in the current configuration to optimize it. And why is that? Well, because for example, um, the, the impact of this gene over the key performance indicator is below the precision that we have with the current simulation accuracy, the simulation precision. Um, and also that can be because of the mutation rate or the mutation rate of other parameters even that limit the refinement of, of these low impact parameters. Um, over here what we see is it actually was an experiment we did and it turned out quite well. What we see on the left is a, a high impact parameter that was converging to a value close to over here and we basically this was not our first uh, our first species to be optimized and we had seen in a couple of other species that they were also converging to this same number so we say okay let's let's try to fix it and see what happens so at generation number 16 we froze these parameters so the genetic algorithm didn't have the possibility to, to, to touch it anymore and we just hard coded it basically and what happened is that a low, perf a low impact gene, which is on the, the graph on the right, which basically made no significant progress until generation number 15, started to converge into a very narrow band uh, up here. So basically freezing this parameter, allowed this parameter to converge. Why is that? Because basically um, the performance the impact in the performance of the value of this gene was not really influenced by the value of this gene itself, but, but by which gene of which value of this gene it was combined in an individual. So until we did not freeze this one, uh, we could not make this one converge. Of course, this has a risk because we are actually manually freezing the high impact parameter. So if we make a wrong decision there, uh, that has a big impact on the performance of the system. But one of the things that can be done is that after the system has refined this parameter, you can allow the, hard imp the high impact parameter to move again and see if it drifts somewhere else. So selectively, you can start freezing some parameters while allowing some other parameters to evolve and uh, yeah, continue that way. What we also saw is that some parameters uh, have a, a too minimum impact on the output for the algorithm to refine. Uh, that's the case, for example, of this one, which basically didn't go basically anywhere. And what this means is that uh, we can optimize this parameter based on other criteria. For example, if it is a multiplicative constant, uh, just find a cheap constant to multiply, like multiply by eight, which is basically for free in power and area because selecting any other number in this dynamic range doesn't impact the performance. So it's also a, by looking at the speed of convergence of the curves, we also see how big the impact of each parameter is uh, on the key performance indicator. Now, another thing that we see, uh, we saw it before already, is that the progress looks uh, the progress of the key performance indicator over time or over generation, which is the same thing, 
looks more or less like an exponential curve. And we see here, for example, that beyond generation number 30 or 40, there is still a bit of progress, but uh, the curve is, is almost flat. So the system is making very little progress in each new generation. What can this mean? Well, if that value is already good enough, then we can we can close the topic and say, okay, this is this is the best individual we could find, or, or a good a good enough individual, and then stop the optimization. We can be in in, in case B, in which we are very close to the optimum for the algorithm to keep on evolving. And what we can do there is to increase the simulation precision, so give the algorithm more opportunities to distinguish good from bad individuals over this dynamic range. We can reduce the mutation rate or the magnitude of the mutation uh, so that it, it starts converging and stops exploring beyond certain point. Or we can do the, the, the strategy that I explained a couple of slides ago of freezing some of the already converged dominant parameters to allow uh, the other ones to, to improve. Another case is that we are stuck at a local minimum and we have several strategies to get away from there. So one of the, well, an easy one or an intuitive one is to start again with a new population and see if we get somewhere else. But we could also add random individuals to add some genetic diversity in the, in the generation. We can increase the mutation rate to see if mutation can take us out take us out from the local minimum, or we can even use more complex structures like islands and migration in which we have several optimizations running in parallel. And then at some point we select some individuals from one optimization, and we migrate it to the other optimization, uh, to the other population. And by that we also uh, add some, some diversity and to conclude, basically we have here the solution space we have explored. We have on the horizontal axis the signal to noise ratio at target BER, and on the right we have the normalized uh, silicon area, and on the left graph we have the normalized power consumption. And basically what we see is, is uh, a dot for the best individual of each species. So a full set of parameter is means a species and an individual. So an individual of a species because otherwise we don't have a full set. And basically with this one is for each species that we have optimized using the genetic algorithm, uh, we are selecting the best individual and take it as a representative for the signal to noise ratio at the target BER. Um, we see that the red dots are the ones that do not fulfill the 13.35 constraint on signal-to-noise ratio at target BER, and the blue squares, they do comply with that, with that requirement. So the red dots are a no-go, and the blue dots are the species for which we have individuals that fulfill all the, the hard constraints. And from those, of course, the best one is the one that has the lowest uh, power and the lowest normalized area. You see here that the dynamic range of power and area that we have explored is, is not so big, so it's around 10% uh, for area, 15% for power, but for a, for a, a block that sinks about 20% of the total module area, that is a couple of hundred milliwatts, so it's, it's not neglectable, and of course this optimization is, is additive to other optimizations that we do on, on microarchitecture level or, or, or other stuff. So that's uh, that's the final present uh, slide from this presentation. So thank you all for uh, for your attention, and uh, please let me know if you have some some questions or some some comments you would like to make. So, thank you very much, Facundo, for this very nice uh, work. It's uh, nice to see that uh, you are doing a very nice work uh, in Argentina. So, uh, very nice work being done by ITERA. 
So I invite everybody that have a questions to put the questions in the uh, chat uh, channel of the YouTube. Uh, about error correction, you are working. Uh, you also consider uh, errors uh, due to radiation. Um, yes, basically this, um, not the radiation effects on the silicon itself, uh, if that's what your, your question was aiming. Yes. Uh, okay, so those ones, as long as they occur and they cause errors upstream of the FEC, uh, this FEC covers them. Um, but if they do happen inside the FEC, then that's, uh, that's not tolerated and it can cause some, some unexpected behavior. So not by the FEC, you, of course you can build a system around it, um, but that's, uh, that's it. Okay, we uh, keep all uh, the work you are doing can also be used for this situation. Thank you. So we have a question by uh, the store campus. So how long does it take to get a reasonable result? Uh, okay, that's uh, that's quite a good question. So uh, our grid had an average of 20 uh, cores available uh, for processing. And for, opt for making the optimization of one species, uh, it took us about five days. Okay, so we explore uh, a couple of tens of species, something like 15 species. Uh, so that, that took quite some time, but for each species it takes about uh, five days of 20 cores. Cores of normal laptops, so nothing nothing special. Okay, we have a, a question by Setu Mota. How did you know in the first place which parameters are species parameters and which are individual? Okay, that's uh, that's a good one. Basically, we made an arbitrary distinguish um, splitting in species and uh, and individual parameters based on uh, yeah, basically a theoretical analysis of what their impact would be on the expensive to measure key performance indicators. So those are power and area. So we took the ones that have a big impact on the power and area. Uh, group them on one side and take all the others and group them as individual parameters. But that was uh, uh, basically um, architecture design and, and seeing uh, the impact of those parameters on, on those key performance indicators. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is uh, the secret you are designing. This project in particular, this is uh, has been developed together with the uh, idea. So it's uh, it's an IP we have uh, provided to them. Uh, an idea over there at uh, Campinas in Brazil. Okay, I think uh, we have no more questions. If somebody has a question, please do it now. Okay, so thank you very much, Facundo. Congratulations, I think, for your nice work. Congratulations also for the, the, the work that is being done by ITER. So it's a pleasure to know that we have uh, this very nice work being done here in South America. The form now is the basic center in uh, Argentina, because we have an idea in my office. We are working hard to make it grow even further. Yeah. I think you are influenced by the close to white region that gives some inspiration. <laughs> So thank you very much. So I hope to see you uh, in another event soon. Uh, 
and thank you very much. And, uh, you have kept our invitation to keep it this very interesting uh, talk. Thank so, you for, uh, for the opportunity to share a bit of what we're doing here at, uh, at Cordoba, at Itera. And thank you all, of course, for, uh, for your time and uh, your questions, your attention. Yeah, for us, it's uh, really nice to see that we have uh, some companies doing very nice work here in, uh, in Latin America. No? Uh, and uh, we are planning to do a, an article about this set of talks related to the Justo talks done by the chapter to, to also uh, diffuse this information to the whole uh, class society.